In the second part of this lecture, I will discuss the use of qualitative methods for different types of evaluation questions. As I noted earlier, qualitative evaluations within public health and health services are concerned with a range of different activities, the development and piloting of interventions, process, or in other words, how programs are implemented and how they are received by those involved in them, the outcome and impact of programs or interventions, and theory building. I will now look at each of these areas in more detail. I'd like to start by discussing the developing and piloting of interventions and how qualitative methods can contribute to this aspect of service evaluation. Qualitative methods can play several roles in the development and piloting of interventions in health. Firstly, qualitative studies of social issues may identify new opportunities for action. For example, the Kelly paper in your reading list outlines how exploratory qualitative research on social capital in communities in the United Kingdom identified ways in which community health could be improved through local social networks. A second example comes from some qualitative work in which I was involved a few years ago. This work looked at ways in which doctors, nurses and other professionals collaborate on acute medicine wards and was undertaken in a large teaching hospital in England. The study used a range of ethnographic methods including individual and group interviews with health and social care staff. These included doctors, nurses, therapists and social workers, and also included participant observation of ward-based work. In other words, um, we spent time sitting on the wards and observing the day-to-day -day activities and work of healthcare professionals. This research of interprofessional collaboration showed that Rather than these professionals working in coherent, multi-professional teams, they tended to form shifting networks of collaboration around the needs of particular patients. This finding suggested to us that efforts to improve collaboration in these settings needed to focus on these informal mechanisms, the shifting networks of activity around individual patients, rather than on more formal mechanisms of collaboration, such as ward rounds or ward meetings. The study illustrates the role that qualitative methods can help or can play in understanding how to develop a new intervention to address a particular health service problem. Qualitative approaches may also be used um, to explore the effects of new interventions. This is particularly useful for complex health issues and interventions, such as those directed at changing the behaviours of healthcare providers, or indeed the behaviours of health service users. It may also be used for interventions intended to change the way in which health services are organised or delivered. These qualitative studies are often small scale, looking for example at the effects of a quality improvement intervention in one or two clinics or hospital wards. For example, we have used qualitative methods to explore how healthcare professionals and patients in South Africa responded to a new pilot intervention based on lay or community health worker support to improve adherence to TB treatment. In this study, we used observations of the work of healthcare professionals and community health workers, as well as interviews and focus group discussions with patients, with lay or community health workers, and with nurses in the TB program and these were complemented with interviews with health service managers, all intended to explore how they res responded to this new intervention to improve adherence to TB treatment. The second area in which qualitative methods can be used is in exploring process. As I noted earlier, process evaluations focus on how something happens rather than on the results obtained. And qualitative methods in the context of process evaluation allow us to do a number of things. Firstly, they allow detailed exploration of how a process unfolds. In other words, the pathway or mechanism between, on the one hand, making a change and on the other, the outcomes of that change. You could rephrase this as, how does this intervention work? 
Secondly, qualitative methods may be helpful in exploring the perceptions and contributions of different participants involved in the, in the program or service change. Thirdly, they may help you to understand whether the program is being implemented as intended, and if not, how and why it differs from what was planned. For example, um, if an intervention or program to improve support for people with tuberculosis using community health workers is not working as planned, is that because the community health workers are failing to reach those who need treatment support? Is it because the nurses are failing to support community health workers? Um, or is it because patients don't find that kind of service or intervention acceptable? Qualitative methods can also be used to explore the contextual, social and individual factors affecting implementation. For example, does the program work differently in poorer versus wealthier areas or in different social groups? This leads to the next point. Qualitative methods can be used to explore whether the program affects different groups in different ways. And finally, um, which components of the program succeeded or failed? Often a health service program or intervention may include multiple components. Coming back to my example of community health worker support for people with, on TB treatment, this may include visiting people in their homes, providing them with additional information, linking them to health services for better monitoring of their care. And qualitative methods can help us to explore which of these components work well and which work less well. As an example of using qualitative methods to explore process, I'd like now to describe some work I was involved in for the Pulsar Plus project in South Africa. As most of you know, South Africa, like many Southern African countries, has a very large national antiretroviral treatment program. Implementing this program requires very substantial human resources in primary health care. And consequently, there is an urgent need for nurse training in the delivery of antiretroviral treatment and for guidance for nurses on how to deliver care to this complex group of patients. The Pulsa Plus intervention combined on the one hand clinical treatment guidelines for nurses with on the other hand educational outreach to these primary care practitioners in the clinics in which they work in communities. The program focused on the primary level management of adult lung diseases and HIV and AIDS including antiretroviral treatment. It attempted to enskill nurses and give them greater clinical responsibility for the management of patients in their care. The guidelines, that is the clinical treatment guidelines for, for lung diseases and HIV AIDS, were introduced alongside the implementation of the public sector antiretroviral treatment program in one province in South Africa. A randomized controlled trial evaluated the effects of the additional educational outreach visits on the quality of HIV and TB care delivered by nurses. Edu educational outreach visits are visits in which a well-trained healthcare provider goes out to individual clinics in the community to provide training and support for the staff there around a particular clinical or health service need, in this case around the management of adult lung diseases and HIV AIDS. Alongside the randomized control trial, we undertook a, process, a qualitative process evaluation. This evaluation had a number of aims. Firstly, to document the educational outreach process. Secondly, to explore perceptions of the training. And finally, to compare the Pulsar Plus training, the intervention that we were delivering, with the centralized model of training used in that particular province. So this was training in which healthcare providers go to a central location to receive didactic training in the form of lectures and demonstrations. I'd like to say a little bit now about the findings of the evaluation that we conducted. This showed that nurse uptake of the Pulsar Plus training was high. Compared to the centralized training that I mentioned, the ongoing educational outreach to all primary healthcare nurses as part of the Pulsar Plus program appeared to significantly enhance nurses' experience of support for their work and to improve experiential learning. This issue of support was particularly important. Nurses valued the trainers coming to their clinic and giving them training in the context of the work that they were doing. 
because the training was closely related to their day-to-day -day activities, they were able to introduce their day-to-day -day problems into the training program and get support in how to address them. The training of all primary healthcare nurses in Pulsar Plus guideline use, as opposed to just training antiretroviral nurses in the centralized training, was also perceived to better facilitate the integration of AIDS care within these particular clinics. Our evaluation concluded that the Pulsar Plus training successfully engaged primary health care nurses in a comprehensive approach to managing illnesses affecting both HIV positive and negative patients. The evaluation suggested that this intervention had the potential to improve the quality of primary health care in these poorly resourced settings. And indeed, um, the South African Health Department has gone on to implement Pulsar Plus training across most of the country and it has also been adapted for use in several other countries in Southern Africa. Right, I'd, move, I'd like to move back now to talk about, continue talking about the different ways in which qualitative methods can be used alongside evaluation. As I mentioned, qualitative methods can also be used for outcome and impact evaluation, although this is less common. Particularly, the use of qualitative approaches only for outcome evaluation is controversial. They're usually used alongside other approaches and can be useful in Firstly, exploring the effects of program on outcomes that are difficult to measure. For example, I talked earlier about a study of social capital and health in communities. In such a study, qualitative methods could be used to explore the effects of health interventions on activities or phenomena like social networks and social support. Qualitative approaches can also be used to explore whether a program is sustained over time. And finally, to explore effects across different groups or sites. For example, is a program to reduce smoking seen more positively among high-income groups than among low-income groups? So this illustrates the ways in which qualitative approaches can be used in the context of outcome or impact evaluation. Finally, I'd like to talk a little about how qualitative methods or approaches can be used in evaluation to build theory. What do I mean by theory? Well, one can understand theory to be a set of statements intended to explain a set of facts or phenomena or social relations. Bolton has described theory as a model which defines the variables of interest and the expected relationships among them. For example, this would include things like theories of behavior change, such as the stages of change model, and theories that might explain organizational change or other kinds of behaviors. In the case of grounded theory approaches, this theory emerged from the data collected in the field. In the context of theory building, qualitative approaches may be useful firstly in developing models to explain phenomena. For example, phenomena such as adherence to treatment, risky sexual behaviors, or nurses' attitudes to clients. Qualitative methods may also be used, in the context of theory building, to explore the extent to which theoretical models account for the changes seen during and following program implementation, and also to explore how existing theory needs to be adapted to account for new research findings. This brings me to the wider topic of using theory and evaluation. One of the later lectures in this course. We'll explore this in, in more detail, but I just wanted to introduce the topic briefly now. Of course, all research has a theoretical basis, although this may not be made explicit, particularly in the positivist paradigm. For example, an intervention to improve adherence to treatment, such as the one I was discussing earlier, makes assumptions about the individual, social, or contextual reasons for poor adherence about how these relate to one another, and about how change in relation to adherence might be affected. Whether we make those theories explicit or not, we all have ideas about how an intervention or program may work. For example, um, how delivering support to mothers may improve their use of antenatal care, or how delivering support to people on TB treatment may improve their adherence to that treatment. So how can theory contribute to evaluation? Firstly, theory can contribute to shaping research 
by providing a framework for approaching the research issue or problem. Theories may help you to understand or hypothesize around the different steps or stages in a process and then design research to explore whether those stages are occurring in the sites in which the, the program is being implemented. Secondly, theory may influence the collection, analysis and interpretation of qualitative data. For example, a study of treatment adherence drawing models of structural factors affecting adherence, things such as economic status, would collect very different data to an adherence study which is used as a model focused on individual healthcare behaviours. In a study focusing on structural factors, you may be more concerned with patients' economic status, the amount they earn, um, disposable household income, and so forth. In a study that focuses more on models of individual healthcare behaviours, you may be looking at factors that influence these behaviours, such as peer or family support, interactions with healthcare providers, and people's beliefs about their treatment and illness. Thirdly, theory may be useful in locating findings within a broader explanatory framework. This may also be useful in comparing findings across studies. Where studies have all drawn on similar theoretical frameworks, it makes it much easier to then consider all those findings and make comparisons or contrasts between findings from different contexts. Finally, theory may provide an approach to explaining why interventions succeed or fail for example, through suggesting mechanisms of action. As I mentioned, there will be more opportunities to think about the use of theory in the lecture that covers that issue. I would, however, like to illustrate this, issue, this point by looking briefly at an example of the use of theory within evaluation, and particularly a study that used qualitative methods to explore this issue. This is another study conducted in South Africa and as some of you will recall, South Africa implemented a policy of free care for pregnant women and children under six in 1994. And then in 1996, the policy was extended to include all primary health care services. The aim of the study was to explore how frontline nurses in busy urban primary health care clinics experienced the implementation of this free care policy. The study drew on so-called bottom-up theories of policy implementation. These theories suggest that frontline providers, such as nurses or doctors working in primary health care clinics, must have discretion in taking decisions that allow them to respond effectively to the different needs of patients or clients. However, the high, or the high demand for their services may force these frontline providers to invent routines or practices for the mass processing of patients. In other words, to come up with strategies to allow them to manage the very large number of patients they have to see in a day. The major concern for these frontline or street level implementers is how to control the stress and anxiety um, of their day-to-day -day work, as well as the complexity of managing large numbers of patients with sometimes quite difficult and challenging health problems. Out of these concerns grows a whole range of informal routines or coping mechanisms that can, for example, be observed in clinics. The study of the impacts of free public primary health care used both qualitative and quantitative methods to explore the consequences of this policy and the factors that influence nurses' responses to this policy change. So what were the findings of the study? In brief, the authors reported that the nurses in these primary health care clinics felt excluded from the process of policy change regarding the implementation of free care. They felt they hadn't been consulted or included in the decision to implement this program. Furthermore, this change in policy had had significant and often negative impacts and professional consequences for these frontline providers. This included a very sudden increase in the number of patients attending the clinics as free care was implemented. Free care's an unanticipated and negative impacts on provider morale and motivation were exacerbated by pre-existing problems in the nurses' working environment, including poor working conditions and poor support from management. These problems further undermined nurses' ability 
to exercise professionalism in their day-to-day -day work. And their response was to adopt coping mechanisms that, by categorizing and blaming patients for their own problems, allowed them to face the frustrations of their working environment. The authors of the study concluded that bottom-up theories of policy implementation help them to understand the influence of implementers, that is nurses, own values and experiences on the rollout of this policy change. Clearly, implementers adapt and interpret policy changes initiated at higher levels in the health system in ways that not only shape this policy, but may lead to unexpected outcomes. And in this case, the very laudable idea of making primary health care free for all who need it um, had the unintended consequences of greatly increasing the stress and pressure on nurses in primary health care clinics. And because these nurses felt excluded from the process and decisions to implement free care and felt poorly supported in their work environment, they responded by providing care that could be considered to be less than adequate and by taking out their frustrations on users of health care services. And in this we see the way in which frontline providers can reinterpret a policy in ways that have unintended consequences. So, to summarize, in this second part of the lecture, I've discussed how qualitative methods can contribute to different kinds of evaluation, including the development and piloting of interventions, exploration of process, evaluating the outcome and impact of programs or interventions, and finally, how qualitative methods can contribute to theory building. Before listening to part three of the lecture, please spend 15 or 20 minutes on the following exercise. Start by thinking of two to three examples of health programs or interventions in which you personally have been involved. For example, a child vaccination program or an antenatal care clinic. Then consider the following questions. What could qualitative methods contribute to the evaluation of these programs or interventions? What role could qualitative methods have played in evaluating these programs in which you have been involved or, in, or with which you are familiar? And what insights might these methods have given?